Peter Bratzis is a founding editor of the journal Situations. Uh, among other things, he studies state theory and he's a co-editor of the book Paradigm Lost, State Theory Reconsidered. He has published numer numerous articles in numerous places, uh, but that also includes the Journal of Modern Greek Studies. Please, everyone, uh, join me in wel welcoming Peter Bratzis. I want to thank Leo and uh, the other organizers for inviting me. I think, uh, I think we all realize it's a very important uh, moment for the left, and not only for the left, uh, in, many, in many ways. I'm going to try a little bit of a, of, of a different uh, um, focus than I didn't hear all of Leo's presentation. I heard the last 15 minutes or so. And I'm going to focus a little bit less on, less on the events as they've unfolded over, over the last uh, uh, few weeks and a couple of months and examine a little bit, or at least raise the question, of some of the broader uh, structural uh, uh, developments that have led to the present moment. To begin with, uh, to the victory of Sinza, which should never have happened. It is not, I mean, it is good for us on the left. It is good for those of us who have been in the party for many years and we had never thought something like this uh, would happen. But it's not happened for all the right reasons, obviously. And Syriza's victory has, at the same time, and even more so, been a failure of the capital state, I think. And here we have a party that begins, in effect, in 1968 as a split from the Communist Party. It was known as the Communist Party of the Interior, because the leaders were inside of Greece, rather than those who were exiled after uh, the Civil War. And it breaks over at the invasion of, uh, of Czechoslovakia, uh, the Communist Party of the Interior were overwhelmingly uh, Euro-Communist, people who were reading people like uh, Louis Althusser and Henri Lefebvre and Nikos Bouladzas and others, and it was a party of intellectuals, overwhelmingly, that in a country where intellectual life is respected, they could get 3%, 35 4% of the vote. The name changed in the late 80s. By the early 2000s, uh, uh, what was then Sinas Bismos entered into a coalition with some other left parties and became Syriza, which then became very recently, rather than a coalition of parties, a party onto itself. And this is a party, not only that began, no, that is still fundamentally a party of intellectuals. It's also a party without a television station with one newspaper that is not very well read, you know, some people read it, but not, not, not very many people, with, without a, a, a charismatic leader. I know some newspapers call Zibra's charismatic leader, but maybe compared to Merkel, uh, <laughs> qualifies, but, you know, I mean, no, he's not exactly a, a, a Che Guevara or a, or a Mao. So, how is this possible? And I think, and there are many things that Citizen I did well. And there are real reasons why the opposition to austerity in Greece moved to the left rather than to the right. That has to do with decisions Citizen made and its capacity for political maneuvering. But at the same time, it's overwhelmingly a product of the failure of the Greek state to properly function, I would say, as a capitalist state. Now, we know from people like Karl Polyani in The Great Transformation, uh, Louis Althusser, Nikos Boulanzas, uh, and others, that a fundamental regulatory mechanism of capitalism is the openness of the state to demands from below. Thus, for example, Lenin says that the you know, democratic uh, state is the best possible shell for capitalism. In what way? When Poliani discusses the double movement. The idea is that when capitalism engenders changes that may be destructive, that can destroy the actual society in question, the struggles from below and, and, and resistance from below act as a mechanism for regulating the pace and extent of those changes. To make it so that you can have as Marx analyzes in the second volume of Capital, the extended reproduction of 
the capitalist relations of production, to keep the system alive and moving forward, and to make this, the, the system viable as an actually existing uh, society and economic process. This is basically the same idea that uh, uh, Althusser and others re refer to as relative autonomy. That the state does not simply do the bidding of the capitalist class, but is open to political uh, networks from below, and that is a fundamental regulatory mechanism. That has not happened in Greece. We have had in Greece, since the crisis hit in early 2010, 32 general strikes, which is quite a bit. I mean, 32 general strikes, you know, in, in most societies and most situations is an extreme, is, is an extreme uh, level of resistance and refusal. There have been hundreds of demonstrations, hundreds. On May the 5th, when the first memorandum was, was uh, passed by the parliament, they were ready to storm the parliament. And if not for uh, the unfortunate the death of two women in a bank that was set on fire, it may have happened. In the face of all of this, the state was unable to even delay the voting on the various austerity measures and memorandum over these years. There was, it had zero impact. I've joked with my Greek comrades that the only impact it had was to raise the salary of the police. That was the, the most tangible uh, uh, policy outcome of all, of all this resistance. Now, in other, in other times, in other situations, these kinds of struggles had measurable results, whether it's the labor movement of the 1930s, resulting in, you know, from the New Deal in the United States to various other uh, similar uh, uh, policy transformations, the 1960s, of course, in Greece in the 1970s. When the students took over the Polytechnic in 1973, and actively resisted the military junta, it was a very significant uh, blow to the legitimacy of the junta, and it fell a year later. But we've seen in the last four or five years that these old ways through which the class struggle had an impact on, on, on the political process, on policies, no longer worked. I think there are a number of ways we can try to explain that, one of which is the increasing bureaucratization of the state. It's increasing inflexibility when it comes to uh, attempts to address popular demands, <coughs> together with, of course, the fiscal constraints. And in the Greek case, uh, certainly it's a product of its participation in the European Union and the way that the European Union has developed and bureaucratized and limited <coughs> local responses and reactions to various <coughs> political uh, developments. At the same time, of course, is a fundamental th financial, uh, most clearly, of course, in Greece at this point, limitation, which is not a new uh, idea. We can go back to James O'Connor and the, you know, the old idea of a fiscal crisis of the state, which does not happen in Greece in the way James O'Connor had argued happened uh, here in other developed countries, but, not, but it's still a fundamental contradiction in, the, that, in that sense, the accumulation of legitimation functions of the state are in conflict. So, Syriza comes to power, in other words, in a context where the state is exceptionally unable to do things, is exceptionally unable to address and to try to meet uh, popular demands. And the first question that we're trying to figure out now, certainly, both from the, those who are inside the government and those of us who are outside observing and trying to, trying to understand, is, is it possible from the inside of the state to do what was before possible from the outside? What before resistance movements and protests were able to accomplish, can it be accomplished in this case through actually uh, uh, being the, the government uh, winning elections and attempting to, to bring about changes from in that way. And it certainly is not clear that it is. We're going to find out pretty soon, I think, you know, just how impossible or partly possible it may be. Now, the Greek case is, in this case, 
significant because it is the, the canary in the coal mine, in a sense, or it's the most developed uh, situation of what is probably a much broader uh, tendency and, tr and, and, and truth about the contemporary, contemporary capitalism and, and the nation state. In that, it has always been the case in Greece that the state had significant limitations when it came to some of these issues. To begin with, for example, the question of taxation is very important. One of the unusual characteristics of, of the Greek economy and the Greek uh, labor market was that it has an overwhelmingly high number of self-employed. It is the highest of the, in the world. 30% of the labor market is self-employed. And if you include the numbers of those who work in the family business, it goes up to about 37 and 38% which is the, by far the highest in word. By contrast, for example, in France, the self-employed are 4.5% of the labor market. So it is a huge number. And it's a huge number because the kind of capitalist development that occurred in Greece was overwhelmingly what Nikos Brunzas terms, and not only him, comparator capitalism, in the sense that it was very much tied to the region or a global flow of capital, he, 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 called, he terms it a staging post in the global circuit of, of capitalism, and thus ha did not have deep roots in the actual society itself. It was parasitic, in a sense, to Greece itself, like sh the ship owners, uh, or probably, uh, obviously, the clearest case, where the shipping is all about the flows and movement and has little to do with Greece itself. Greece can be finished tomorrow and the, and the ship owners are fine. I mean, they'll, they'll have to change the diet maybe in some ways. You know, the, the cooking uh, will change and the views will change, but other than that, it's no big deal. And the same thing with mining, the same thing with tourism in very important ways. And what used to be banking, because banking now in Greece is non-existent, that is, a, you know, is a completely beholden to the state at this point. Uh, so this was always a very, a very important problem. And that was always a limitation because on the one hand, to be, I mean, it had the symptom of having so many self-employed, how are you going to collect the taxes? It's one thing when it's 4% and it's 5%, and the plumbers and the electricians and the taxi drivers and the kiosk owners, of course, are not going to report the full amount. But when it's 30%, it's much more of a, you know, it's much more of a problem how, how you, as to how you're going to collect. And beyond the, the, the middle strata, the big ones, ship owners, financiers, the big uh, 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 conglomerates, how are you going to get any money from them? I mean, the ship owners had enough clout that they were able to, to get a line in the Constitution of Greece that it is unconstitutional to tax shipping. <laughs> This is, has always been, and it is even more so now, a, a significant problem. To begin with, a significant problem because the Thessaloniki platform that CETISA has put forward as the immediate uh, plan for the next 3, 6, 12 months uh, for addressing the, what, what is termed the humanitarian crisis and addressing some of the uh, repeal of the labor laws that have happened in the last four years and so forth. The estimate is that it will cost $12 billion. And in the costing of the, of the party, they have argued that the $12 billion would largely come from uncollected taxes that they will collect. Now, the presupposition has been that the reason why the tax has gone uncollected is because of the clientele links between the dominant parties of the last 40 years of Pasok and Democratia and their patrons who have not paid taxes, which may be true, but it does, it does not necessarily follow that the state will have the capacity, will, have, will be able to coerce and, up, and oblige a capital to actually pay up, given that it will be a new set of people in charge and new subjectivities. Now, this is a very clear and immediate problem for Greece. It is also a very clear and immediate problem more generally for us, for Europe as a whole, and onwards. And let me point to one, one fundamental uh, shift that has happened in the global economy that has made 
the Canadian economy, the American economy, the German, the French, and so forth, more and more like the Greek economy. And that is, increasingly, economic activity lies in the flows between nation states, this kind of transnational flow, which uh, Leo has certainly has, has done a lot in, ter in terms of examining how the free flow of capital is very much tied to the, the, the new kind of imperialism uh, uh, that, that we find ourselves within. And I have some numbers here, which is unusual for me, but I, I brought some numbers with me to give an example. So, for example, in 1975, cross-border transactions in bonds and equities as percentage of GDP went from 4% to 151% in the United States, from 5% to 196% in Germany, and from 1.5% to 83% in Japan, 1% to 435% in Italy. Now, in the decade that then followed, you had a tripling of those numbers up to 2006, when just before the financial crisis hit. And just to give some perspective, in 2006, the total of global trades in goods and services was just under $30 trillion. Whereas, the trading in long-term U.S. securities and equities, only long-term U.S. securities and, equity, and equities, was $52 trillion. $52 trillion. What is this? What? Why do I think this is an important observation? I think it's very important because the temporal character of capitalism has changed. Whereas, you had our friends in the European Union in the 50s and the 60s, Delors and others, who would come up with master plans looking 50, 60, 70 years in the future. Whereas you had bankers in Switzerland and in Wall Street maybe, the city of London, coming up with 30, 40 year projects and proposals. The temporal impetus of the moment means that everything is short run. The decisions, the necessity for accumulation is increasingly short run and increasingly, to go back to our friend Carl Pogliani, uh, capitalism becomes disembedded from the societies within which it exists. So the Greek limitations that have existed for a long time and become very, very, very important at the present moment are symptomatic of fundamental broader changes. And when Varoufakis, for example, argues that what is needed in Europe is a mechanism for taking the surplus that accumulates in Germany, Holland probably, and some other places, and redistributing it towards the periphery to keep the system going, to make the system reproducible so that everyone benefits, he finds death, death ears. If Krugman and others argue largely in line with Barofakis and the leading members of Syriza that the existing, the existing economic arrangements within the, within the European Union are untenable, and will lead to the destruction and decay of the European Union as such, and will also in, in, lead to significant damage to the national economies of all the, 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 the countries, Germany included. It falls from death, death ears. Now, either we can presuppose that certain politicians are incapable of understanding what is not a difficult, I think, uh, idea to understand, or the problem is not understanding, it's much deeper than that, and it has to do with the capacity of the political system now to impose a logic on capital beyond this short-run emphasis on profitability in order to ensure great, the greater reproducibility of the system and impose some kind of other logic. So here, I think, is the first, uh, not only for the Greeks, but for all of us, the significant test Sidis opposes which is, it, it is the nation state, or are the political, existing political arrangements sufficient for addressing this temporal transformation within capital and the increasing disembedness of capitalism throughout the world, Greece most spectacularly and most uh, disastrously. 
That, I think, is one fundamental question. The second fundamental question, I think, that Greece will answer for us, or maybe an answer, is the possibility of transforming the desire people have in their participation within political life. Now, in Greece, people did not support Syriza because they want, as I've suggested many times, but no one listens to me, they want the priests fired as public servants as the first step in addressing some of the, you know, uh, fiscal uh, constraints upon the Greek state. Uh, I've said much more worse than that, but that, you know, publicly I only say we, we fired the, the priest. Um, the desire in, within Greece, up until the last week, and I, in the last week things may have changed dramatically, but the desire was a desire for security, for comfort, for safety. The fear that was obvious within Greece in these years, when, if we elect Syriza, what could happen? We could be thrown out of the Euro, what would happen then? Refrigerators would go back to costing a lot of money, you know, maybe wouldn't be able to get our medicine, maybe wouldn't get our, get our, our fuel. That was a, 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 a outcome of a, a certain liberal ethos where what is overwhelmingly our, our, our way of, of dealing with political questions or, or the fundamental desire that underpins politics is desire for utility. Utility maximizing, you want security, safety, the role of the state is to provide protection from these various potential threats. Now, the problem here is, if you want to then transform liberal society, how can you do it when a society whose fundamental desire is liberal? And Greece is not the most liberal by far in terms of uh, the possibilities. Of course, the United States is much, much, you know, it's all you know, incredibly worse. Uh, the situation in, in Britain is, uh, is quite horrible as well and so on down the line. The Germans are much better. So how can you then transform a libidinal economy that has, for decades now, created consumers, possessive individuals, as the, you know, one of the great Canadian Marxists uh, uh, termed it, the theory of possessive individualism, into communists, in the true sense of the word, of people who are for a new society, for dealing with the common issues and creating something new, something democratic. The, you know, I mean, the, the, the Aristotelian principle of you know, politics is for the purpose of creating more excellent human beings. Not for protection and isolation. We can go back, of course, to Marx on the Jewish question. So this is a very difficult question because the question is not only one of structural capacity and is it, you know, can the existing machine, the existing political machinery be used to cower capital and be able to, again, embed it within the societies and within, within which it exists. The question is, who's going to do it? And this is a very, very, uh, I mean, I don't know if, of course, it cannot be, this question cannot be answered. It's a very, very difficult question. And I will point just to an illustration of how difficult it is. The degree to which human beings today reduce themselves to think of themselves merely as animals. And as one symptom of that, I've been <coughs> writing a few things on this, we have, you know, a strange phenomenon in the names people give to their dogs. And whereas 40, 50 years ago, you know, if you read Claude Lévi-Strauss, The Savage Mind, he has a very nice chapter on the naming of animals. And he says dog names, he, has to, he explains why, but he gives examples of dog names, you know, what, what, they're never human names, they're always Lucky, Spot, Laika, you know, whatever the case may be. And if you look now, in New York City, for example, the number two most popular dog names are Max and Maggie. And of the top 20, 15 are human names. Now, this, I believe, is very significant as a symptom of the reduction, this new libidinal constitution that we have, that capitalism has created, and we become reduced simply to our animal base. Of utility maximizing, seeking warmth, shelter, and all the rest, and refuse political life. I mean, they, they, they think it's a, it's not an insult if you name the dog after your favorite uncle or aunt. I mean, it's, you know, it's a sentient being after all. 
So this is the, the, the I think these are the two fundamental difficulties that uh, we are presented with, and which the present situation in Greece goes from becoming an experiment in how low people are willing to go in imposing a kind of neoliberal uh, project to an experiment in what are the possibilities in the societies as they, as they actually exist today. And Greece may be a best case scenario from the subjective standpoint, not from the institutional capacity standpoint, to break from liberalism and to create something new. Thank you. and Pasok, I think there are many important differences between the two, not the least of which is that Pasok uh, came to power as a very nationalist party. Its slogan was uh, Greece for the Greeks uh, when it won in 1981. And it seems it's coming to power with exactly the opposite line, which is that Greece's problems are Europe's problems. They can all, only be answered to, uh, collectively. Uh, so it's explicitly an, an open from that standpoint. Now, from the standpoint of the corruption, let's say, or possible corruption of its cadre and leaders is always a possibility, but it has to be successful to get to that point. And Paso came in power where they had, uh, the Greek economy was in decline, but there was a surplus there. They could do, uh, you know, they could be corrupted in that sense. Whereas Syriza now is in a much different situation. And if they get to a point where they can, you know, uh, corrupt, become corrupt, it will be already a big success because it will mean the economic austerity uh, will be finished and it will have, uh, you know, you know uh, solved many of the, uh, the practical problems um, uh, within Greece. The question of, of the left group within Syriza, uh, I'm, to begin with, I don't agree that they're more left of the rest of Syriza. And uh, for the simple reason that the main question that divides the two is what is the euro and whether one should stay within or stay outside the, the Eurozone. I don't think the idea that you should reject the Euro is more left than the other, because they're not matters of principle, they're matters of, of strategy. And the, 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 the arguments on the other side is that being in the Eurozone are one of the few, uh, few levers we have left, the few weapons that are left, one of the few is that. Because if, if Greece were to be pushed out of the Eurozone, it, it would have very significant and, and uh, uh, unpredictable uh, consequences to the rest of the Eurozone economies. You could have a run on Italian and Spanish sovereign debt, which is somewhere north of three and a half trillion euros, which is a lot of money. And if, we're, if that were to happen, there's no, I mean, it, everything is possible, but it would be very difficult for the, for, for the ECB or the, the, uh, for the Germans, uh, you know, the German uh, uh, National Bank to cover those kinds of amounts. So that's one of the few weapons that are left. So I don't see it as a difference in goals. Is is a tactical, uh, you know, uh, 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 disagreement. Uh, especially, you know, we, we should we should emphasize here that having a different currency does not save you from being dependent. You know, the United States has is able to have core peripheral relations with all kinds of countries without having a common cur currency. And Greece was also in the periphery of Europe before the Eurozone. So it's a political question, it's a question of, of political power that has some technical elements, you know, it, when, when you speak of, of the Euro and the Eurozone, but even if you're outside of the Eurozone, you know, you're, if the answer were that simple, it, it, it already would have been done. Uh, but it's much more uh, complex, it's much more political, and it, it is, a, is a difficult question. The banks, in effect, are already nationalized, because without the, the state, the state uh, underwriting the banks, they, they would have closed uh, a long time ago. The question is, if you make it more formal, or you keep it in the hands of, of these private managers, uh, in that sense. The question of the working class is an important question, uh, uh, precisely because in Greece now, less than 50% of the population are actually employed or active in the labor market. Mm -hmm. So who will be the working class? And then if you, if you, you know, for already you have half the population outside. Then if you include all of those that are part of the petite bourgeoisie traditionally, that's another 15, 20%, the public employees and so forth. So you're down to relatively few, uh, you know, as a percent of the population of people employed 
and what, you know, the Spartacus groups, or, you know, because all kinds of various groups have accused me of being petite bourgeois collaborator and so forth the last few weeks for, for being in favor of Syriza. Uh, I, I mean, it, you, it's hard pressed to find the traditional working class in Greece as it's understood, uh, you know, in, in the old uh, texts uh, of Marxism. So it's a very, very uh, important question. I, that's why I think it, it, we're better off thinking in terms of what kind of desires are being operated, you know, what kind of, what, you know, to, towards what ends are you struggling? Uh, because even in that case, as the comrade here pointed out, if you have people who are nominally working class, but, they, the, but their struggles or, or their political uh, impetus is, is fundamentally liberal, is about maximizing, you know, the individual utilities and making sure we have uh, a, a good standard of living or as, as well as could be expected under the conditions, then it's certainly not a revolutionary uh, moment. Thank you. Leo? Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to begin with the movements in decline, which I think is very important. Uh, sorry, is this working? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to begin with the movements in decline, which is, I think, right and very important. Uh, people got tired. Uh, you can only protest so much, and it's been clear for the last year and a half. Uh, that although the solidarity networks, solidarity networks continued, and where people were meeting together, providing food and health care, pharmaceuticals for one another, and, and activists and series at the local level were very much involved in that, and as Judith said, uh, MPs were putting part of their salary to those solidarity, solidarity networks. 25%. Uh, a good chunk of their salary, 25%. 25%. Uh, uh, nevertheless, you know, there was a, everyone said there was a clear decline in movement, and in, in the run-up to the election as well, one would have hoped, as one saw uh, the series uh, percentage of the opinion polls go up from the high 20s to even in some polls the high 30s, they ended with 36 percent, that that wouldn't just be about indicating they vote, but people would be also mobilizing in the streets. And, you know, there's a tradition in Greek politics, especially in Syriza, where, you know, when they have party meetings in the squares, the people dance and they argue and they talk, and, and I was hearing that a lot, 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 of, lot of that was going on. So in a certain sense, it was people uh, coming to Syriza, but not in the sense of a left culture, uh, and not in the sense of a mobilized culture, in the sense of throw those bastards out, uh, we've got to give these guys a chance, we believe them, they're likely honest, etc. And that's why I think it's so important, and that's why I was stressing, and I think Judith was asking the right question, to what extent is the party even interested in, let alone capable of, mobilizing in that respect, mobilizing at the base, getting the movement going. In some senses, the government doesn't want this. This is a headache. Right? You've got enough problems dealing with the class struggle. They're also going to have all these people knocking on their doors. Right? And it might even be doing creative things, right? That is, you know, starting to do things at a local level, cooperatives, uh, uh, expanding the solidarity networks, and demanding, right, support from the state, right? So I keep asking the people I know uh, uh, whether, uh, first of all, all of the talent in the party is going to be drawn into the state which is what's largely happened in Bolivia, I, people don't talk about very much. It's understandable. And that comes out of a movement-based party. Uh, and if that's the case, who will be left in the party? Uh, and are they going to be appointing people, as exactly as Judith said, are they going to be appointing people who will, have, who will be cadre inside the state, whose job will be paid by the bloody state? It ought to be. Right? Precisely to be organizers of the unorganized, right? mobilizers, you know, animators, etc. There's not much evidence that this is happening. Uh, you know, I think that, that uh, you know, this is a problem. Uh, and it's very much to be hoped that those elements in the state, in the party, uh, uh, who, who do are, are sensitive to this will really start pushing in this direction. Now, the main problem with the left platform is not, in my view, that they've been in favor of Plan B rather than Plan A. It, I think it's more than just it doesn't matter, in my view, Peter. It does matter uh, in the sense that if you're not part of the European, certainly the European Monetary Union, you are pushed by virtue of that 
to do some radical, very radical uh, things that don't depend on, depend on bribing capitalist investors. Now that may, it may make people worse off, it's true. Uh, but you have to find a way to get public investment and, and planning. And I think that the people who have been pushing from the left platform for getting out of it, it's not just a matter of going back to the drachma, it's that they do see that this would force them towards a more socialist economic strategy. But what the left platform are not any good at, are certainly not any better at than the rest of the party, certainly not than the 53 plus people, is they aren't very good at being organizers and mobilizers and cadre and motivators at all. And in fact, people who are active in the solidarity networks told me that they're ashamed to bring them to party meetings. Ordinary people who are supportive of the series, etc., because all that happens at these branch meetings, there's arguments over plan A and plan B. And people think, well, what the fuck's this all about? Right? We wanted to get some cooperative stuff going on in our community. And all they want to do is argue policy. And they, they, they don't come there for They won't bring them. Uh, so that's a problem. In other words, to what extent are these guys revolutionaries in the sense of building a revolutionary base or just talking about an alternate policy? Right? And it's my experience that the left platform people actually don't have a politics. They have a policy, but they don't have a politics. Uh, and that's a very different thing. On the international thing, I mean, we've often said this before, I mean, in a sense, it, it sounds ridiculous to say, Greece is like Russia in 1917. Uh, you know, in which you know, it is dependent on change in Western Europe, in Northern Europe above all, and above all in Germany. And, you know, it was the weakest link thesis that uh, the Bolsheviks were operating on, and they were hoping for a German revolution. And it didn't happen. Now, you know, we can't be talking about revolutions given the state of the world today in that old sense, but at least in the sense of a shift in the balance of forces. So I do think it, it is right to say, if you talk to people who know what's going on, that Syriza is encouraging people, as Ernie said, to build support and do send, you know, Peter brought Michael Spurdelaki, so I've been talking about to New York. Uh, he did public speaking, he met with the nation, he met, uh, you know, I think he had a, a shot on democracy now, or at least met with some of those people, etc. Uh, so I think they are trying to build that kind of stuff, and uh, some of the things I've heard is that one of the reasons that uh, the Germans are, especially Merkel, is, is, is so negative about them is that they're worried that they're having some impact, not only via the Linke, the left party in Germany, but even, even via the unions who are attached to the German Social Democratic Party, which is actually part of the government, right? uh, who have had some meetings in support of Syriza, etc., which Syriza has encouraged. Right? Now, but we're very far away from, from any shift in the balance of forces, and one has to say social democracy in that respect, as you said, the bloody MDP, but you know, much worse than that. Scandinavian social democracy. I mean, it's absolutely appalling. You know, this is the model of you know the strong social democratic states, uh, and and their governments have often been more bloody minded, and even more racist about the about the lazy Greeks, right? Uh, than have the Germans. Uh, so you know, this is really a tragedy in a sense, and it's very very important. Um, and there, too, I think, it is also a matter of party capacity. I mean, you know, does Syriza have the capacity to... Tsipras is the representative. He ran as, as, you know, the key figure for the coalition of left parties in the European Parliament. Right? He was running for the European presidency for them. Uh, so they, in some senses, you know, identify with Syriza as their leading party. Uh, but how you know, much of a base are they able to build in the working class, uh, given that social democracy still retains the loyalty of the majority of the working class, uh, is a big problem. And German workers are savers. Uh, and therefore, you know, they look about what does this mean for our savings if Sears upsets the European financial system. And this needs to be countered, and what capacity do we on the international left have to help counter that? I think is, is a big question.